Hello and welcome to Chain Reaction, a podcast series examining America's role in the world. I am your host, Aaron Stein, the Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. Every two weeks, we will talk to experts about a variety of topics and why they matter for U.S. foreign policy. On today's episode of Chain Reaction, I speak with Michael Kaufman about the latest in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, what Putin may say in the May 9th speech he's about to give, and the future of the conflict moving forward and the potential for escalation. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Uh, for those who this is the first time listening, uh, Michael Kaufman is the director of the Russia team at the Center for Naval Analysis uh, and has frequently joined this podcast and others to discuss the ongoing Russian war, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, I should say. Uh, Mike, we're recording this on May 6th. Um, you know, President Putin has a big speech coming up May 9th in commemoration of the Victory Day in Russia over the Nazis in Germany. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where the conflict is and why that speech may matter moving forward, given what's happening on the ground? Sure. So, of course, it's a bit difficult to tell what's happening on the ground day by day in the war. But I think the best way to maybe summarize it is you have a very slow and grinding Russian offensive around the Donbass, particularly in the northern part around the Siversky Donetsk River, and a lot of sort of fixing Russian attacks. Uh, towards the south and Zaporizhia and the original the kind of line of control uh, opposite Donetsk. You have Ukrainian counterattacks taking place as well. One pushing out from Kharkiv, where they tried to push away Russian artillery from the city. And uh, sort of a battle line that seems to be shifting back and forth between Izum and Slavyansk. Izum is one of the main hubs for the Russian offensives, and the Russian forces are trying to create kind of two envelopments to the extent they can. One around Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, and another one around uh, Severodonetsk, where they're sort of a salient of Ukrainian forces. But in general, Russian progress is slow, even though they've changed up how they're fighting. They're pursuing it more methodically, you know, using artillery or guns and the like. Uh, the correlation of forces isn't that favorable to them, right? Ukrainian units are pretty strong. They offer a lot of resistance and... Uh, a lot of the Russian military has been attrition in the first phase of the war. The truth is that Russian losses during the first couple of weeks of the war have been quite high. And those have had fairly deterministic effects on the prospect of this offensive. And this offensive, even if they do make some gains, which I think they are likely to make, it, it's looking increasingly uh, unlikely that they will be able to capture all of Donetsk and Lugansk, at least as, as the political objective had been laid out to them. Certainly at the pace of the attack, this is very likely to be the last Russian offensive given their force availability, right? That is, they're likely to be exhausted no matter which way it plays out for them. Turning to the main I speech, so uh, it's clear that Russian political leadership has some hard choices to make. If they intend to sustain this war, uh, they are likely going to have to enact some form of mobilization. The Russian military is a tiered readiness force. It was never based around the idea that they could fight a large conventional war of this kind without mobilization and a dramatic increase in manning levels. To do that, Vladimir Putin would have to declare a general state of war. Okay. Now, some people kind of conflate this with a declaration of war against Ukraine. Um, that's fine. Potato, potato, that is, you can, you can call it different ways. But declaring a state of war in the country would then allow him to enact all sorts of policies and changes to um, everything from conscript terms to mobilizing reservists to mobilizing uh, service age men and the like and to resolving all the manpower issues they're having. Uh, is that going to happen May 9th? I am pretty skeptical because I see most of the Russian decisions being condition based, not, you know, hey, here's a specific date on the calendar and on this date on the calendar, they're going to do this or that. So I'm not a big fan of the date fixation. But I think on May 9th, you're likely to see uh, him really work to reframe this war. They've spent several weeks now in, in the state-run media shaping the narrative that this is not really a Russia-Ukraine war, that this is a war between Russia and NATO and the United States in which Ukraine is just a proxy. And they're clearly doing that because they're preparing public attitudes for an explanation as to why the special operation isn't succeeding, why they're not making progress. Because they're not going to say that they were defeated by Ukraine, right? They're going to say that they were they were essentially fighting the United States. 
and also to set the background stage for the need for national mobilization at some point. So I'm beginning to think that sooner or later, uh, this is going to be likely. And it's just sort of a matter of, of when in this war. Uh, and, and most likely he's going to reframe this war as, you know, as always one of, uh, of these sort of a more amorphous aims. Because the initial operation was launched, you know, under the notion that they're going to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine. And Putin never actually explained what that meant. So that he could then, you know, define victory on his own later on. And even the operation in the Donbass, the refocus on the Donbass, was stated by the Russian Ministry of Defense. It was actually never stated by Putin that this is the sole and desired end state. He's never been clear what the end state is. It's increasingly looking likely that the desired end state is probably to take the Donbass in the south. And I think what we might get more clarity on on May 9th is regarding the plan to either to potentially annex these regions. Right, because it's clear that the Russia intends to occupy these regions for some time now, and there's not going to be any trades involved. Can you talk a little bit about the mechanics of full mobilization? You know, because if it does happen, you know, that's going to lead to a lot of people to assume that the war is going to continue. Is that your assessment as well? Or would it be more like perhaps to backfill a trident forces in anticipation of I guess, holding territory that they officially annex, uh, moving beyond the conflict, as you just said. Yeah, so if Russia annex national mobilization, I want to be clear, it doesn't mean that Russian fortunes in the war suddenly dramatically change, but it really alters the calculus on Russian ability to sustain the war. It means that the war is going to continue for most likely a very long time. It dramatically reduces the likelihood that Ukraine will be able to take back territory it's lost to the February 23rd line. And this is significant, Aaron, because while the war maybe a strategic defeat for Russia. I think I think it's a strategic catastrophe for Russia, to be frank. Um, it is not necessarily a victory for Ukraine either. No country is going to look at a loss of territory population, a substantial percentage of GDP, and a sustained economic blockade and say, that is what victory looks like, right? So there is some kind of minimum criteria for Ukraine. Yes, Ukraine remains an independent state and has fundamentally defeated the main Russian plan in this attack, okay? But wars like this grind on. And if it's a it's a victory, it's certainly Pyrrhic. And then there's a big question of can Ukraine retake control of this territory? Now, if Russia enacts national mobilization, what you're going to get most likely is first stop loss of personnel. No more conscript rotation out coming in the fall. Uh, that's about 135,000 potentially uh, in terms of manpower. You're going to get activation of reservists, bars reservist system. They are quite old, but they're backfill units to hold territory behind the main line. So they create basically manpower for you to hold terrain behind the main battle lines. Most importantly, you can now mobilize uh, men with recent service. And if you appreciate that the Russian military has contractors doing contract servicemen doing multiple years of service and getting out potentially in that 18 to 27 year old bracket, plus conscripts where they're rotating out around 250,000 every year. If you just look at the category of men with recent military experience within one to three years of service, and yes, these are very perishable skills, let's be clear. I, I fully appreciate that. But you like, don't forget how to shoot an AK-47 the day after you get out of the military. Which, like, let's also be clear about that too. Not, not all skills are as perishable on the same timeline. Then these, then there are essentially hundreds of thousands of personnel that they could have access to with recent military service that would require potentially a refresh or some retraining, so it's not instant, but they can quickly begin backfilling these units. They can raise manning levels in current formations, and they can rebuild the units they've lost over time, those battalions. And so then the constraints would be more on capacity to train these personnel and on equipment available for them. Well, if we you know, talk a little bit about this, you know, one thing in the run-up to this conflict that the Russians were constantly saying, and whether it was genuine or not, I think at this point is immaterial, was that they wanted to prevent the NATOization of Ukraine, right? Whether sort of de jure or de facto. I think that's failed, right? But if this goes the way you think it does, and I, and I think you're right, where you have Russia annexing territory in Ukraine, you are going to have de facto a NATO and U.S. sort of open it, or are we going to end up in a de facto NATO open-ended place where aid and weapons will be continuing to flow into the conflict? And so will that reframing of Putin actually prove, you know, again, you know, to justify 
the mass mobilization of, of conscripts because it actually sort of like fits the way he's he's described the conflict as it's ongoing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And, and to be clear on this one particular point, you know, this is not this is not just a war be- between Russia and Ukraine or just Russia's war in Ukraine. Right? Much of the West, uh, in, in this case, is arming Ukraine. This is dramatically changes any expectations of how Ukraine can sustain the war because Ukraine's essentially has access to a tremendous amount of manpower that they mobilize and the equipment they need to turn that into effective combat powers being provided by the West, in particular the United States, but also other other European nations. And so uh, increasingly, as it was going, the, the, as the war is progressing now, the overall military balance trends in Ukraine's favor. Unless Russia enacts national mobilization, which is probably going to be a decision put to them, I think, in, in the coming weeks or maybe months, Right, where the military is going to go to the political issue and say that they can't sustain the war in this manner. And the way Putin's going to frame it, it there is some truth to it. I mean, it, it is fundamentally a war between Russia and Ukraine, but also with uh, United States and NATO countries being a material party to the conflict. That's, that's, that's the reality of it. And as I see these sort of spate of news articles coming out this week indicating the extent of uh, U.S. intelligence support for uh, some some of these Ukrainian successes on the battlefield. More and more is coming out about how much the U.S. appears to be involved directly in this fight, more than just providing equipment and training. At least from what I can gather, it's almost like a waterfall of uh, leaks from U.S. officials to newspapers in the last couple of days. Uh, long story short, I, I'm sure they're going to uh, leverage this narrative, and and then also. You know, you have increasing Ukrainian counterattacks striking Russian critical infrastructure in Russia, right? So as this progresses, you know, how much longer will Russian officials be able to sustain the story of this being as a special operation without eventually uh, just saying that this is an outright war with Ukraine? The biggest problem they have, in my view, and this is the bailout point, is that I believe the reason why they are trying to do everything short of declaring a state of war is that once they do that, They can no longer define victory down. They can no longer say we're conducting national mobilization to capture Kramatorsk, a town nobody's heard of. Okay. Second, the regime's fate is then inexorably tied to the campaign because a special operation can be ended by the regime at any point. Like they can write a story as to how they ended it and why, wherever it stops for them. But the general war with Ukraine cannot. People will demand victory. Right. And you know what victory looks like. Victory looks like the other side's capitulation. OK, so a general war where you mobilize the public is not one where they can just stop it. People are going to look to see victory and, and people have a general sense of what victory in the war looks like. OK, it's one of those we know it when we see a type of situation. And last point, general mobilization is incredibly unpopular. That is why they don't want to do it. They want to try to raise money piecemeal by offering a lot of money in contracts. So if they go through with it, they're going to have to deliver something that looks like success. And if they fail then that's going to have tremendous implications, I think, for regi- for the regime's survival. You led me to my next question, which is this sort of waterfall of leaks. You know, uh, off the top of my head, one was from The New York Times. The other one was from NBC News, each describing some of the U.S. intelligence that's being provided, one of which I believe attributed to The New York Times was location information on Russian senior officers on the battlefield, uh, which is not something I would want to be talked about in The New York Times, even if we can suspect it uh, beforehand. Uh, up to and perhaps including, you know, Gerasimov's uh, visit to the battlefield uh, and in reports that he was uh, wounded uh, in uh, Ukrainian artillery strikes. And then location information for the Moskva, the uh, the Russian uh, cruiser that was sunk by two Ukrainian uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. Can you talk a little bit about those leaks, uh, what you think it means for the conflict and perhaps um, how it reinforces Russian paranoia, if at all? So my guess is that... Uh... Russian military undoubtedly had suspected U.S. involvement in supporting Ukrainian operations and that this will just confirm what what they most likely assume to be true. So I don't think this is going to change anything dramatically in, in terms of the war or perceptions of the battlefield. What it does for us, and at least as analysts, is it helps uh, helps us appreciate the extent to which some of these uncanny successes Ukraine has been having how much the United States may be responsible for some of that performance, right? Because there's a lot you don't know about a war, 
barely two months into it, lots of things that come out initially are not true, or at least are partially true. And I can tell you from a lot of experience, the hot takes on the internet are usually wrong, especially especially early on to any conflict. And only later on do you get decent information coming out that helps you paint at least a semi cogent picture of what really took place. So I myself obviously don't know what happened in any of these cases, although I'm sure you've heard me You've heard me speculate regarding some of the stories as to, as to what I think might have been true or not, just as an analyst kind of going off my gut instinct. Yeah. To me, the, the biggest challenge is that, well, DC can't keep much of anything secret. That's very clear. And, uh, and, and that's, that's, very, that's very obvious. And I've been in this town long enough to kind of see it. And the long-term consequence is that whatever you may think of, of that's going to happen in this war. Uh, I I suspect that years from now we will get involved in some conflict somewhere. That's almost inevitable, given the track record of U.S. foreign policy. And Russia will do its very best to try to revisit this kind of experience upon us somewhere else. Not necessarily under this regime. Not necessarily in the near future. But uh, I'm I'm sure they won't forget uh, the U.S. role, and they're probably going to blame us much more for Ukrainian success than actual Ukraine. Because they're, you know, Russia's a deeply chauvinistic culture. They're never going to admit that they were losing this to Ukrainians. They're going to go through a cycle of confirmation bias where they're going to basically assume that they lost this war entirely thanks to U.S. involvement in it. That raises a really sort of uncomfortable question. You know, every day you can have clips ripped from, I, look, I don't know the name of the television show, but sort of like the guy who dressed as all in black with sort of the cl- close cropped salt and pepper hair, right? And sort of everybody's screaming. And it inevitably ends up in some sort of state-sponsored or state-allowed threats to escalate the conflict beyond the borders of Ukraine. You have this paired with Russian official statements that they're going to target NATO convoys. Now, they've been saying this since day one, Right. And so the threat has becoming less and less credible. But nevertheless, in this sort of scenario, post May 9th, with the possibility of call-ups of conscripts and mobilization of reserves, what does escalation look like? You know, especially with this with this torrent of leaks about direct U.S. involvement in the killing of Russian personnel. Yeah, that's a great question. So first, regarding interdiction, okay, it's clear they can't directly interdict the flow of weapons, arms, and fighters into Ukraine. What they've been trying to do for the last two weeks is disrupt the actual ground line of communications, target rail hubs, rail networks, electrical substations, and now increasingly bridges across the Dnieper, right? Which is something that I think was a puzzle for many observers looking at this war, why the Russian military two months into it wasn't doing much of anything to to disrupt uh, Ukrainian ground line communication, which is something a lot of people expected to happen on day one. But clearly they're now coming after it as a systematic campaign. The truth is they don't have the capacity to actually interdict the flow of arms. To do that, they'd either have to have force on the ground or they'd have to have air superiority and ISR there, and they have neither. And Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe outside of Russia. So, you know, good luck to them trying to interdict the flow of arms and supplies to Ukraine across all the different, you know, countries that Ukraine actually borders and this vast territory. That's just not, I don't think it's realistic for them at all. On the escalation side of the house, so... To me, I think the immediate escalation, the risk of it, is probably not that high. But where I have where I have concerns, looking out uh, some months in, into this into this war, is if the Russian military is really losing, and it is looking like Ukraine is likely to recapture a lot of the lost territory, then it's going to put them to some hard choices about either escalation or accepting defeat. And their options for escalation are quite limited. None of them are good. One is general national mobilization, which which actually would take some time to show results. It's not like you enact mobilization and the next day you have uh, some kind of added fighting potential. Uh, another is uh, nuclear employment and nuclear coercion, basically using nuclear weapons for demonstration purposes and then threatening Ukraine. I mean, people don't, nobody extends nuclear deterrence to Ukraine. So there's a very visible vulnerability there. Beyond that, there isn't a lot that I think Russia can do on the escalation front that would necessarily be smart for them, but doesn't mean they wouldn't do it. Yeah, things like strategic cyber attacks against the West and so on and so forth, things we haven't seen yet. And and just to be clear, there's there are folks out there who often think that Russia hasn't done something, which means that they can't do it. 
And I'd be very careful with that assumption. Just because something hasn't happened yet in a war doesn't mean it's not likely to happen sometime down the line. There also, there's all sorts of reasons why a political leadership might show restraint in these sort of categories of escalation or want to reserve them for when they're in more dire straits. So I guess maybe like this, this leads itself to like the final question here and we can wrap up, which is, you know, officially the campaign out east has started. But do you expect there to be further escalation? Does the Russians have the capacity outside of of national mobilization to increase sort of the tenacity, I guess, of its of its operations out east? I mean, or do you think we've we've essentially settled down into a war of attrition, which the Ukrainians could use to their advantage to begin to take back some territory, or will settle into more or less the current conflict lines that we're seeing, and that you know this could become the Sort of the jagged edge of the uh, of the of the guess the new Russian borders, according to themselves, um, if they want to annex territory. So I think there's actually going to be a shifting battle line, at least for the coming weeks, with both the ongoing Russian offensive and Ukrainian counterattacks. There's no obvious stalemate often off in the near future. I just don't see that yet. Uh, a war of attrition, as it stands. You know, on the one hand, it favors Ukraine. On the other hand, if Ukrainian forces end up doing most of the attacking in the next phase of the war, then on the ground, just tactically, may favor more Russia. But Ukraine has access to what in some ways could be considered almost an unlimited amount of now equipment and ammunition from Western countries, which makes a huge difference. To me, we're not there yet. Like, we're not near any stalemate. We're not uh, into a war of attrition. I suspect that the Ukrainian military would try to see what they can capture back once they feel they substantially exhausted the Russian military, and we're going to see how that works out. I think that probably there's going to end up one way or another being an operational pause later on in this conflict. We could get to a place where both sides have settled into a temporary stalemate to rearm and re-equip, and then one or the other will launch an offensive later this year. And it could go on this way for a while. So, you know, just to sound that note for folks, there's no evidence that this is going to be a short-run war. And, you know, Russia can't, Russia can't necessarily quit this war very easily either. But generally, it is the loser of a war that gets to determine, at least more often than not, when the war ends. Which I know sounds counterintuitive, but uh, it is the losing side of the war that has to concede defeat. The, the victor doesn't doesn't necessarily get to determine where the conflict ends. Maybe, maybe outside of maybe total war scenarios. So it's very hard to see an end to this war anytime in the near to medium term, or why either side would necessarily give up. And even if Putin comes out on May 9th and declares victory over whatever they've captured, the war is not going to end. Ukraine's going to keep fighting it and is likely to take back at least some territory that they've lost. Well, with that, Mike, um, uh, I appreciate you coming on the show um, and giving us the latest rundown. And, um, you know, thanks for joining us. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Yeah, thanks for having me back on the podcast. Be sure to subscribe to Chain Reaction on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to be notified about new episodes. To explore more from the Foreign Policy Research Institute's research, podcasts, and upcoming events, please visit us on www.fpri.org.